The New York City Law Department is responsible for all the legal affairs of the city. It represents the city, the mayor, other elected officials, and the city's many agencies in all affirmative and defensive civil litigation, as well as juvenile delinquency prosecutions brought in family court and administrative code enforcement proceedings brought in criminal court. The Law Department's proposed budget for fiscal year 2018 totals $207.7 million, including $148.2 million to support 1,706 budgeted positions. Changes in executive plan include an additional $40 million in fiscal 2014 for judgment and claims payments or for funding for settlements uh, for lawsuits facing the city. In addition, the department is budgeting an additional $455,000 to hire six new staff in its Office of Special Enforcement, as well as $122,500 to hire an additional legislative staffer for the Office of Legal Counsel. During today's hearing, we'll be discussing the Law Department's handling of judgment and claims and claims against the city, the department's progress in uploading an online updating an online portal so that all New Yorkers can have easy access to the city laws, the department's preparation for handling an increased caseload from Raise the Age, and many other issues of importance. With that, I will ask the uh, committee council to uh, swear uh, you in. Please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm uh, to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before these committees and to respond honestly to council member questions? Thank you. Feel free to read, summarize, however you wish. Oops, that would be good. All right, good afternoon, Chair uh, Kalos. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm seated uh, here with, uh, with uh, First Assistant Corporation uh, Counsel uh, Georgia Pistana and with our managing attorney, uh, Muriel Goodtrufant. Uh, and I have other staffers here. Uh, who will be available to uh, provide any information uh, that's necessary during the course of these proceedings. Um, I know this, it, 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 this is the end of a very long day for you, and, and you have uh, our testimony in writing. I, I will just uh, uh, pick through and give you some, uh, some highlights that I think are, are worthy of note. Uh, the volume of litigation uh, matters pending uh, against the city uh, presents a substantial challenge, as you know. Uh, the tort division alone uh, defends nearly 22,000 cases currently pending against the city, its agencies, and employees. Uh, approximately 7,500 new tort cases are filed against the city each year. Uh, more than 6,000 cases are resolved each year by trial, motion practice, and settlement. Uh, with the council's assistance, this fiscal year, the law department has begun to transform the manner in which cases are handled in the Brooklyn and Bronx offices of the tort division. Uh, due to the volume of cases pending in the tort division, until recently, most cases were handled by several attorneys, with different attorneys handling only a segment of any case. While such case handling has certain efficiencies, uh, case handling by one person uh, or a unified team from beginning to end, which is uh, usually uh, uh, characterized as a vertical assignment system, uh, permits better development of case theories leading to improved trials motions and settlements. Uh, three years ago, the Law Department created a unit within the tort division to handle cases in defense of law enforcement in this manner. That change produced, that change approach has contributed to a marked decrease in the new filings in the past two years, uh, at least a 20% decrease each year. Similarly, in fiscal year 2012, and uh, continuing thereafter, staffing in the Special Federal uh, Litigation Division has increased to permit more proactive case handling, including taking more cases to trial. Since that time, the new case filings have decreased. The number of cases tried has tripled, and our win rate in these federal trials now approaches 90 percent. As a result of these efforts, the city litigates a significant portion of civil cases which are tried by juries in the federal courts. In fiscal years 14 and 15, the city cases um, accounted for 24 percent of the total federal civil cases tried by juries in the United States District Courts for the Southern and Eastern Districts of New York. In fiscal 16, city cases were 27 percent of the total of completed civil jury trials. Uh, the transformation of our tort practice uh, will permit not only improved case handling, but also improve our good trial practice in New York State Courts. Of all civil jury trials commenced in Supreme Court civil term, city cases accounted for 
10 to 14 percent of trials between 2014 and 2016, uh, and the percentage of trials is a substantial, uh, such a, a, a percentage of trials is a substantial presence considering that more than 80,000 new civil cases are filed in the state uh, uh, within the New York uh, City each, um, each year. Uh, while the Law Department has been transforming our tort practice, we are also beginning planning for the transformation of our family court practice, uh, particularly as a consequence of the, of the Raise the Age legislation uh, that, uh, that passed in Albany this past uh, year. Uh, so I thank the uh, Council for its support, and I uh, am ready to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. With a uh, win rate in the federal court that uh, approaches 90%, I'm glad to have you defending me. What, what is the win rate in the uh, state courts? Do we have that information? It's more than 50%, but it's not quite 90. Okay. Uh, it's, it's a great record to have, at least on the federal level. I'd love to see a stronger record on the uh, city level. Uh, well, that's, well, now we're talking about trial conviction rates, and that, that does not take into account the, um, uh, the uh, cases that are di dismissed on motion, which even though uh, trial practice gets the most notoriety, and obviously, and, and, uh, and among uh, those of us who are trial guns, pro provides the greatest level of personal satisfaction, uh, every dismissal counts as well as much as every as every trial victory, and so those are extraordinarily important and take a tremendous amount of work on the part of a lot of folks on our staff. I, I having been a litigator, I uh, completely understand the yeah. sheer number of uh, cases that you will win on the motions long before uh, you will ever get to trial. Absolutely, and I, I, it is it is it is the tip of the iceberg, as it will, right. as it were. Uh, so um, I, I think uh, similar to DCAS, there's a familiar reframe and some questions that bear asking. So uh, as we're at a budget hearing, uh, the first question is, is there, now that we're in the executive budget, is there any additional funds in the budget for the mayor's defense? Do we have anything for fiscal no. year 2018? where we're budgeting for any of the mayor's defense? No, we, we are uh, very much in the, in the wind down phase. The last uh, numbers that you, uh, that you received uh, estimating uh, the amounts in connection with the defense in, con in connection with the, uh, the investigations that have been obviously concluded um, are, are pretty much up to date. So I, if, I, if my memory serves me in the preliminary, there was still a million budgeted. We weren't at that point on the other side of the investigation, so I'm, as, I'm asking if that has been reduced from one million to zero for the coming fiscal year. And if not, what, what works remains s starting July 1st? Nothing for the coming fiscal year. Okay, so that million dollars is back in the budget, there's, okay. Yes. And there, there are no further ongoing investigations for anybody else related to it? That is correct. Great. And so. How much did all of this cost the city all in beginning to end? Approximately $13 million. Okay. The Conflicts of Interest Board released an opinion on March 29th stating contributions to a legal defense fund for public service must be treated the same as gifts and must therefore be subject to gifts restriction no more than $50 per donation barring the adoption of specific legislation that distinguishes gifts made to public servants through legal defense firms from other gifts to public service. Uh, will this ruling result in taxpayers footing the bill for uh, similar litigation in the future? Sorry, s similar uh, prosecution or investigation in the future, will it have any impact? It shouldn't. And, and then just, just to be clear, so the, give me one second. So with all the investigations concluded, the defense concluded the mayor has been cleared of all charges. That's correct. Great. Uh, next piece, which is the thing we like to talk about is judgment and claims. Yes. Uh, so, first question is. Uh, well, I, actually, uh, I've handed up a, a chart. Yes, um, please. Because this obviously is a, re a recurring and important uh, question and a, and a matter of, uh, of uh, appropriate interest for the, uh, the council. And one of the frustrations, and I'm sure we, we're not alone in this, uh, in terms of describing year-to-year uh, -year fluctuations is, um, is a way of describing it in a way that um, 
we highlight the um, year-to-year uh, anomalies uh, that distort um, in any one year or maybe even a couple of years uh, the, uh, the judgment and claims experience. And uh, this is a chart, as you will see, reading from left to right, uh, that uh, includes fiscal years 2010 uh, through uh, so much of, of, of this fiscal year as has been concluded. I, and, if, I, if I may interrupt for sure. one moment. So for those watching at home or online, uh, you can download the testimony from today, and this will be included. Uh, and I guess one quick thing, just so I can f have a frame of reference. Sure. The numbers we've been talking about classically are in the 700, 600 to 700 million range. And on your chart, we're looking at a, uh, a, a around 400 million range. Correct. These, these are judgment and claims attributable to the law department only. Gotcha. All right. This is and not versus controller. the other this funding. Is not is any, right. And who is the other? Who is the remaining three hundred million? That's the controller and HHC. So that's medical malpractice and controller. Correct. This this would have ended up with us fighting a little less about it over the past <laughs> couple of years. Okay, so right. I, I think it would be helpful just moving forward if if in the budget when you're working with uh, our, our good friend uh, Dean Fulan to break out your budget between your judgments and claims, controllers, uh, judgments and claims, and H plus H's, so that that way the appropriate folks can concentrate in the right areas. But this is incredibly helpful. Great. And as, as, you, as you can see. And, and you, you'll agree to do that with Dean. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Absolutely. Uh, and, and as you can see, and, and obviously the, uh, the, the chart speaks for itself, um, the blue uh, signifies all judgment and claims of less than $10 million. The green, and that really uh, 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 illustrates the anomalies, uh, are judgment and claims in excess of $10 million. Uh, and so you'll see that, if it, uh, for instance, in going back to 2011, uh, the total amounts were $392 million, and, it, and, it, and it's a sawtooth uh, in the years following that. And you can see in the year uh, just prior to 2011, it was significantly less. Uh, but then it, uh, it, uh, it uh, uh, got larger in, um, in uh, um, 2014, but then was reduced again. So it, 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 these numbers bounce up and down. Uh, but there's a certain amount of consistency uh, in the claims uh, that are under $10 million, which is the, which is the bulk of the claims. One of the things that, I, uh, that um, uh, as I said in, our, in my preliminary um, um, uh, remarks, um, is that uh, because of the reduction in filings that we think are at least partially attri attributable to some of the new initiatives in the, in both in torts and in, and, uh, in the trial success on the, uh, in the special federal litigation, is that that should begin to have an impact over the next few fiscal years in terms of judgment and claims because we're having a, a market reduction in filings. So first, I just in, in the top line number, we understand that from the preliminary plan uh, to the executive plan, uh, give me one second. Okay, so the issue is that we're running into is just we're dealing with a, a, the, the overall judgment and claims budget and you're, we're, we're now trying to reduce to, to a lower. So I guess what we're looking at coming into this hearing is that for fiscal year uh, 2017, you had increased judgment and claims budget uh, and uh, what we were seeing was the judgment and claims budget increasing uh, from FY17 to FY18, and then just continuing to increase by about 15% a year. Uh, and so just trying to, uh, about $15 million every year. But, but, you, but you're comparing the all-in numbers right. but to uh, these, and that's unfortunate. Do you, do you happen to, off the top of your head, uh, on, if, if perhaps on your chart for, for the future, uh, and I like this chart, if you could have the, the four-year projection? Sure. Uh, but do you happen to have that four-year projection? Not at, not at our fingertips. We, we, we can provide that information. So I, I guess looking at the big picture with the numbers that we've been talking about for the past three years, uh, it looks like the costs are going up, 
and uh, my, 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 my counsel had, had wisely noted it, it's, it, it may in some places reflect inflation, but on the other hand, I'm, I, I am a tough client at times, and so we're, we're paying you more, and I want my lawyers to win more. It sounds like you are, but it still seems like we're still planning to pay out more. Well, let, let, me, let, me, let me make one observation, because uh, generally when you have to pay more, that's all bad news. Uh, but there's one area in which I think you will agree with me that it is um, the appropriate cost of good news. Um, virtually all of the, you, uh, the, D, uh, of the uh, um, DA's offices uh, within New York City have taken the um, appropriate step of establishing conviction integrity units uh, within their offices in order to um, um, uh, open old cases where there are indications where an injustice uh, may have occurred and where someone has been wrongfully convicted. And over the past several years, there have been a number of cases, some of which have gotten substantial publicity, um, in which it has been discovered that persons had been wrongfully convicted and spent decades in jail. Uh, those cases um, have um, uh, resulted in substantial settlements uh, in the tens of millions of dollars. And a lot of the, and a number of the uh, torts settlements over the last uh, a few uh, fiscal years have included um, settlements of those wrongful conviction cases. And while um, you know we, we, we try to we, we, we would like to settle those cases fairly, they have to be uh, settled and to the extent that it is reported to us by DA's offices that these are cases that they believe uh, that persons were wrongfully convicted, we have to uh, uh, agree to a settlement that, that justly compensates uh, those victims and families. And how many of those cases are settled through an initial offer without a lawsuit versus following a lawsuit? There have been, uh, I, I, don't, I don't have all of those numbers at my fingertips. We can give them uh, to you. Some There have been cases that have been settled by the Comptroller's Office okay. uh, before they were filed. Um, um, uh, uh, sometimes in close consultation, sometimes not, but always uh, in, in our experience uh, settled on, on fair terms. Uh, and um, uh, so there, there are cases where there has been no litigation at all. Um, generally speaking, once it has been determined, um, uh, and usually that's with the assistance of, of, the, re of the affected uh, DA's office that uh, they have come to the conclusion that uh, that this is an actual innocence case. Uh, the case is pretty, uh, get, get settled without uh, protracted litigation. So looking at the, the sheet you've given, it appears that since this administration has taken over, there have always been a payment, there have always been about $53 million or more per year in payouts over $10 million. Uh, and so how many, how much longer will this remain? Uh, the statute of limitations in many cases is six years, so uh, at a certain point it's no longer the, the us paying for the sins of a previous administration, it then becomes us paying our, for our own mistakes. Uh, well, the, st the statute of limitations doesn't deter is, is not determine is not the sole determinant because well statute uh, because plus the case and uh, plus how long the case has been pending once it's filed. Yeah. Of course, once the case is filed, the statute of limitations uh, yes. um, has been told. So there are cases, uh, and there were a number of them pending when uh, w uh, when the uh, when the with the advent of this new administration, of cases of very long standing. Uh, that had not been resolved and have now been resolved. And there, and there are going to be always be cases in the pipeline. So w would you share a report of the pipeline of the, the cases in the pipeline that have potential liabilities where the, everyone sues for a million dollars? I'm not sure how many people now sue for $10 million. Uh, so just trying to remember, for federal procedure is federal court is $75,000. Right. What, but what, what everyone we, always sues for a million anyway. But so we we will we will do the best we can to yeah. pro, to, to pro, provide an estimate of cases that are pending that we believe realistically would have to be resolved at ten million dollars or more. And I don't know if you already have such a report, but whatever it looks like, it may be a strong recommendation to have such a report of like the 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 date of incident, the the date of filing. 
and what the status of the case is and, and projected either settlement or court date just so we can have an idea of mm -hmm. if this is something we can do so that we can hopefully get those cases right. dealt with and right. then start focusing yeah, but on just, But just, just, just uh, 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 so long as it's understood that we can't provide information that compromises our ability to negotiate settlements. Understood. I'm, I'm asking. So, and so we, we're talking about. So, if we we, we we can talk about things in the aggregate, but obviously, will not be a case by case. Well, well so right. If, if I was so inclined, I could go to Pacer or, or the state court filing system. Go to each case, look at the complaint, look at what they're claiming, and so I'm just. I assume you have some sort of case tracker. I'm not looking for what the disposition is, whether there have been settlement offers. I'm just looking at what what the what the pipeline looks like. What the, what the dates have been I, I think that we'll be in a position to provide you meaningful information right. that'll answer your your uh, your question without compromising our uh, and, and so who who represents h plus h it's not you not in med mal in med mal they represent themselves that's correct in med in med mal cases they represent themselves they have okay. their own in-house counsel uh, and your mic's on sorry now it is it, i think uh, in med mal cases, H and H represents itself. They have their own uh, group of lawyers that specialize in okay. med, med is mal. Is there, cases. is there, do their lawyers? So let me just look at our budget. How much is for H plus H, and how much is for? Okay. Sorry, give me one moment. Uh, can you say your name for the record? Sorry, Georgia Pastana. I'm the first okay. assistant. Uh, so if, if in, in the next week, if you can just get us a breakdown of the judgment and claims, because you apparently have access to information that we don't in terms of the breakdowns between controller settlements, things that you're handling in H plus H. But I guess along the same okay. lines, um, we do not have a break. We have our own numbers. We do not have ex We do not have numbers beyond our own numbers. Okay. So that information you'll have to ask for uh, for uh, from um, from OMB. Okay. Uh, so I guess one question is just for H plus H. Uh, do you, is there an opportunity for law department to work with them to reduce their med mal li medical malpractice liability and whether or not. Uh, there, there is any efficiency. I imagine you're a much larger law firm as it goes than they are. We don't represent H, uh, H, uh, HHC in those cases. Okay. Uh, so that's judgment and claims. Let me go to another quick line of questioning and then hopefully we can get folks out uh, sooner than later. Uh, so during the preliminary budget hearing, you indicated that you would not like to change the current law department budget structure, which only has you, uh, you units of appropriations for personal service and other than personal services due to the operational flexibility it grants you. While I understand your desire for operational flexibility with the counts are concerned over the law department's current budget structure greatly reduces the transparency of your budget. Uh, I think this whole talk about judgment and claims has been a, an indication therein. Uh, would you not agree that you could restructure your budget to allow you greater flexibility without significantly constraining your operations? No, in a word. I mean, it, and, I, and I would, I mean, I don't want to waste your time because yeah. we've talked about this in, in repeated cycles and our position hasn't changed. Okay. Um, and I don't, and I doubt that yours would either if you were corporation counsel, because I know you're an experienced uh, uh, litigator. Um, we need the flexibility, given the breadth of our responsibilities for representing all of the legal interests of the city of New York, to be nimble in moving resources from one um, uh, obligation uh, to another. Uh, and that's not always predictable. I mean, we uh, didn't... Uh, uh, we, I, I, I think as of uh, on the 1st of I, I, November I, of last year, we wouldn't have known what the national election would be, and, sometime, yes. and, may, and maybe that affects uh, So that, that leads resources. into my next question. Uh, what kinds of lawsuits are, should the ex city be expecting? At the, the very least, it may not have a budget impact. Sure. It may, the, there will be a budget impact because you're going to need to take affirmative litigation steps. So um, what type of lawsuits could the city be expecting for federal government regarding the issue of sanctuary cities? How can we best prepare to defend against such uh, 
items and what type of affirmative lawsuits should we be budgeting for? Are these things that you could do internally or you would need to bring uh, counsel uh, in as consultants? Uh, and uh, is there any affirmative le legal action we can take today to protect ourselves from anything in the future? Well, I, I guess the, the short answer is all of the above. And, and we have been engaged with um, other jurisdictions around the country uh, who have uh, common concerns uh, about uh, the jeopardy to um, um, uh, uh, to um, um, reductions in uh, federal funding for um, um, important services, and uh, and as is a matter of public record, there have been uh, court challenges uh, to uh, executive orders. Uh, there have been. Um, uh, discussions about preparing um, uh, in the face of uh, threatened or rumored uh, executive orders that, that could have implications for the city, particularly cities, cities with uh, large uh, immigrant populations and with policies that tend to be supportive uh, of, those, uh, of those populations. Uh, so we have um, filed amicus briefs uh, in, in, in certain cases and others. We have, uh, we have had uh, dialogue, as I've said, with other cities in preparation for possible um, uh, legal action. And so we, we, are, we are doing everything we can to be prepared. How much should we be budgeting for uh, law department internally to be responsive and pre in preparation? And how much should we be budgeting for uh, external counsel? For so we don't need external. We don't need external Council at at this uh, at this point, I, I think that um, um, that we should we will be able to marshal the resources uh, from from our current uh, budget, uh, and 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 fortunately, uh, and, and this is it's a it's a it's a time to be proud of being part of the legal profession. Mm -hmm. um, we've had lots of uh, volunteer help uh, and offers of help from uh, from the legal community in New York, so I think we'll be fine. At the preliminary budget, we talked a little bit about Raise the Age. Both of us support it. Uh, and so Raise the Age legislation was signed into New York State law on April 10th, 2017. will affect 16-year-olds as of October 2018 and 17-year-olds as of October 2019. Uh, shifting casework to the uh, Law Department's Family Court Division starting in fiscal year 2019. Uh, can you walk us through how Raise the Age will affect uh, your operations and just my my own inclination is that uh, hopefully many of them will not actually end up in the juvenile justice system and you'll actually have to spend less on t attorneys and more on uh, diversion. Actually, um, I think that for planning purposes, the more responsible cor course would be to um, expect that the addition of 16 and 17 year olds will be completely additive. Um, and, and I would not, uh, based on the experiences of other jurisdictions, count on the same reduction uh, in, in caseloads that some have experienced because all jurisdictions are different and, and, and New York City is just a different scale. Uh, the other thing is that I think that what has not uh, been taken sufficiently into account in terms of the kinds of services, and I know you're very interested in, in diversion, uh, but diversion can't be just uh, a, a, a keeping people out of the system. It ha also has to be quality services in support of, 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 of um, the, uh, the persons who are diverted. Um, as people in public education know, the difference between 13 and 14 and 15 year olds on the one hand, mostly middle schoolers, and 16 and 17 year olds who are high school students bordering on adulthood are as different, forget apples and, 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 uh, and, and uh, are as different as apples and oranges. And, 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 um, and we have to plan accordingly because we are now dealing with an age cohort uh, that family court has not uh, dealt with in the past. And we will have to re uh, reimagine uh, different kinds of ser services that, uh, that uh, support this, uh, this age cohort. We also don't know right now uh, what kinds of decisions that DAs will be making in terms of their decisions to, uh, of what category of cases to remove uh, to family court. As you know, under the 
uh, raise the age uh, 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 legislation. Um, uh, unlike the current statute where you, where you have a limited number of JO offenses um, uh, that, that uh, DA's office can elect to keep in uh, as for uh, adult uh, prosecution, all felonies are in play when it comes to 16 and 17 year olds. And so we won't know until the until we're actually in the implementation phase what percentage of 16 and 17 year olds are going to end up in the in the family court system. So there's some there's certain there there's uh, there are uncertainties. Uh, to the extent you can share any, so, so I guess one key piece is uh, would you be willing to work with would you be willing to include the city council amongst the cohort that you'll be working with including the five district attorneys and others in uh, as you're moving forward and uh, getting ready for this absolutely and is there funding necessary f to get rid of get ready for this in terms of structuring so that uh, on day one in October 2018 in the fiscal year okay. 2019 there's there is there is planning uh, uh, that is being coordinated by MockJ uh, chiefly uh, to uh, to organize all of the affected stakeholders uh, to determine based on what the final shape of the legislation was because there was uncertainty around that and as you know a lot of uh, negotiation about the what the shape of the statute was going to be toward the end of, uh, of the legislative session uh, but th but there are there are currently talks about what will actually be needed in terms of city uh, additional city resources uh, to to um, meet uh, meet everyone's obligations under raise the age in response to my diversion you, you made a very my, my advocacy for diversion you made a very strong and welcome point that they have to be quality programs what can the law department do between now and October 2018 to ensure that there's a sufficient number of programs that are of sufficient quality so that we can use diversion as a strong tool in as many cases, if not all cases. I mean, we have to we have to uh, we have to have consultations with all the affected stakeholders, uh, uh, chiefly the courts, um, ACS, probation, uh, all of these stakeholders will, and also with all the not-for-profits who are currently in the business of providing services to 13, 14, and 15-year-olds to determine which one of them can expand to include 16 and 17 year olds and whether or not we need to find additional stakeholders to provide and services. Are those convenings already happening? Yes. Okay. And, and again, and again th those have been under the, uh, under the aegis of, of, uh, of uh, uh, the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice Services. So, so I don't have oversight with them, but if you could dr drag this committee chair and, and our staff to that table, we would. Sure. It would be helpful if only just to see the work happening and know that it's happening. I, I give credit for, for, for work, even if sometimes it doesn't materialize. Uh, sometimes, despite uh, our best efforts, nonprofits have scaling challenges, and so it, it's helpful to know everything that we're trying to do to help. Sure. Uh, me. Uh, there is legislation I care particularly about because uh, as a, a young lawyer and even as a council member, I, I like the law and I, I want to be able to read it, but uh, I actually, I, I, I'm bound by it, but I can't actually access it unless I pay a fee often. And so in New York City, uh, we passed a, a law online. Uh, where are we? In, terms of progress for allowing for folks to be able to download it and work with it without actually having to go through the city's website. Uh, uh, and so that's the plain language version of when will the open API be available for folks to be able to access the city's laws. Well, as I understand it, and this by way of a progress report, uh, as of this week, the charter and administrative code have been updated through May 4th and the rules through May 10th. Uh, the site is fully searchable, uh, and text can be saved in multiple formats. Uh, we're in the process of reaching out to OpenGov Foundation, which has developed tools uh, for the average user uh, to increase accessibility. Uh, but I don't know if we have any any more recent information. We haven't heard back from them yet. We hope to. Okay. 
So, so uh, the, the point of an API is just so that the, the site is great, I use it. Uh, it allows you to, uh, instead of having to log into the site to check if the law changed, an API allows a computer to send a message to your computer and say, when's the last time you updated? And it says May 5th, and it's like, oh, I already have the May 5th version. No problem. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, what ends up happening is you have to send a computer to read the entire thing and then compare it to the additional version to see, oh, is it a new version or another version? And it, it will reduce your server load because I assure you that people are paying attention to it by, with their computer. So uh, I would love to see that happen before my first term in office is over. Okay. Uh, give me one moment. If we have any additional questions, we will, if we have any additional questions, we will send them along and look forward to working with you on many of the different partnerships. We're sorry for keeping you past the five o'clock. I actually have a okay. rule in my office. Uh, I try to keep people from having to work past five. I don't want a culture of people who hang out past five because they feel pressured to by those who might wa work longer hours, such as ourselves. Uh, so uh, my hope is folks are headed home. So just by show of hands, who's headed home right after this? Okay, so um, if we can ask that the law department make sure that our, our best lawyers have uh, a strong work-life balance and that we get them home at five on weekends. Unfort unfortunately, this, this afternoon may be the last sunshine we see for the next 48 hours. I was just looking on the radar, it's not looking good. F fair enough. Well. Uh, just uh, thank you for all the great work you do defending our city, and thank you for participating in this hearing, and thanks for staying a little bit later. Thanks for all of you who have been watching online. Uh, you can uh, email me with any of your thoughts, questions, or comments at bkalos at benkalos. And for members of the public who wish to testify, there will be a public hearing on. You can find it out at city council. Sorry, at council.nyc.gov. Thank you, and I hereby adjourn.